The global economic forecast for the rest of 2019 looks stormy as some analysts see dark clouds on the horizon. Economies across Europe are slowing, China's growth is decelerating and trade tensions have spawned uncertainty. In April, the International Monetary Fund cut its 2019 global growth outlook to 3.3%, which may be down only slightly from an earlier forecast of 3.5%. However, it marks the weakest growth rate since 2009 when the world was gripped by a recession. Some analysts warn that another recession looms, perhaps even more serious than the one a decade ago. What can be done to avert another economic crisis? And is the forecast all doom and gloom or are there glimmers of hope? I recently spoke with a more pessimistic expert, Frank Jürgen Richter, the former director of the World Economic Forum and now chairman of of Horasis, an independent think tank that focuses on global business. Frank, thank you very much for joining us today. Now, you build a business out of advising governments and uh, the private sector on issues such as globalization and trade. And in a very recent opinion, pay, uh, opinion piece, you predicted that the next financial crisis will be worse than the 2008 crisis. And you also proposed some ways how the world could prepare for it. Uh, explain for us why do you think it's going to be worse than the year 2008 and how soon is that going to come, come to us? The current state of the world is quite gloomy and we are learning about bad news um, every morning ranging from uh, terrorism and um, uh, the terrible attacks uh, in Sri Lanka just telling us what happened uh, to Brexit and to um, US-China trade war. Most of the large companies globally are now about to revise their growth figures. Soft is very, uh, growth is very soft and uh, they hold back on investments. And I believe um, we might enter a new economic crisis. If you think about uh, public and private debt globally combined, we are now at 250% of GDP. It's 30% above what we experienced in 2008. Um, also, uh, with the US-China trade war, um, countries like China, of course, and US, but even European countries like Germany, very much depending on export, might suffer. So I believe uh, we are entering a phase of stagnation which might go into um, uh, even a technical recession and uh, an economic crisis uh, by the year's end or by the first quarter next year. And maybe there are two reasons why I'm so uh, pessimistic. We see the rise of populism, nationalism and protectionism and much less collaboration than uh, in 2008. In 2008 everybody worked together, central banks, governments uh, across the globe and was, uh, really the, the aim and the goal to fight economic crisis. Mm. Now with this rise of nationalism, everybody is fighting against everybody. It's like a dog eat dog mentality. So you basically are predicting a much worse economic crisis coming before the end of this year, most likely, or at the beginning of next year. Well, in an April piece, the chief executive of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, Larry Fink, he said that he sees no sign of a global recession in the coming 12 months. He also added that the central banks have loosened their policy above all because the weak fourth quarter of 2018, and he said we'll go through a phase in which things are not great, but also also not bad. How do you see his argument? I might um, disagree with him and of course he is arguing from a US perspective. The US economy was doing quite well until recently from the 2% GDP growth under Obama years uh, going up to 3%. Of course all linked to the tax cuts um, President Trump uh, started in the beginning of his presidency. But now the effect of the tax cuts is kind of uh, fizzling out by the years and we might um, be back to 2%. With the coming uh, trade war um, and uh, frictions... You mean the ongoing? Ongoing, exactly. We might even go lower than 2%, maybe uh, reaching 1% uh, very soon. And then uh, we are soon into technical recession. Uh, if you look into uh, other markets like Europe, um, some countries are already facing a technical recession, like Italy. And Italy is a much bigger market uh, than Greece. Greece uh, was at the center of the economic crisis in 2008. But if Italy is falling, I think the whole Eurozone is falling. Uh, then a few of the emerging markets like Turkey even, uh, Russia and Brazil are in big trouble as well. 
So the signs are not very good. So he was, you think that he was talking about the United States economy probably not looking too bad in the next 12 months. Uh, do, you think, do, you, do you think there is a possibility that things can go bad outside the United States and yet stay relatively manageable inside the United States? Do you see that scenario happening? Uh, I don't think so because now the world is so integrated and uh, you know, uh, with globalization and supply chains, you can't really you know, be isolated anymore. And um, China, for example, um, out of the economic crisis 10 years ago, uh, people talked about the decoupling of the Chinese economy, and even China might feel uh, the headwind. So everything is this being integrated time. this time, mm -hmm. and that's really the issue, that with globalization, you can't really just fight for yourself. Yeah. Well, you talked about this trade war and the implications of it if it is not resolved uh, properly. Well, at this moment, uh, we understand that significant progress has been, or progresses have been made uh, in the trade negotiation between the two sides, and there are all kinds of guesses when an agreement is, be, is going to be coined. So in case that is the case, in case that really goes through, now, will that postpone, will that change your outlook? Uh, yes, I think the, um, the, it's like a double whammy of uh, US-China trade war and, and Brexit. Of course, if we have a soft Brexit and if we have um, an agreement, things look much, much better. It's just a downturn, but not an economic crisis. Personally, I believe there will be no deal signed uh, in May. There have been, um, Why not? Uh, because, you know, Trump, uh, President Trump is now um, focusing in, in on China. It's my, my guess. You mm -hmm. know, he had all the internal issues back home, and now the Miller report is out. And uh, I think he's um, uh, in a position of strength. Um, he wants to be re-elected, and I think uh, a very easy target is China. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure there won't be no si deal signed in May, and uh, maybe the whole negotiation might uh, track on until the end of the year. And um, uh, hopefully there will be a, a deal signed, but um, if, if it's very unfortunate, uh, then uh, the, the real trade war will start. How, how bad is, is the situation going to be if uh, indeed no trade deal is signed between the two sides until the second half of this year, let's say? It will be very bad. I would say for the U.S. at least minus 1, minus 1% 1 GDP growth uh, for China, maybe minus 2. Uh, yeah. And for countries like Germany, uh, minus one. Think about German car manufacturers uh, manufacturing in China and exporting to the U.S. So they're kind of in between and everybody is involved. As you mentioned, in 2009, the world was able to talk to each other, collaborate under the framework of the G20, for instance. And right now, at this moment, uh, with populism, with economic nationalism, you think it is still possible? You know, we see a lack of leadership, especially in the Western countries. There's no single leader coming up. Uh, President Macron was um, very much in the limelight when he came to power. He said, you know, he said he will be saving Europe and maybe the world, but now he's under attack back home, the Yellow West movement, and uh, there's a lack of trust in our institutions in Europe and in the US, and that's the reason, you know, this lack of leadership that we can't really come to multinational agreements anymore. Um, I would love to see uh, China taking a leading role. We have the One Belt, One Road Summit, and it's a very historic chance, I think, to, uh, to go for an agreement and to find an agreement. How significant do you think the Belt and Road Initiative, given in the context of all the things that we talked about, the possible economic recession and the kind of political landscape we're, we're experiencing and the, the lack of global leadership you just mentioned, how, what's kind, what kind of potential do you think the Belt and Road uh, is representing on the part of China for global economic governance? I think it's, it's a good initiative. Uh, China should now add on the physical infrastructure, um, adding also the, the soft infrastructure like education and, and services to complement uh, the, the physical infrastructure. But it's an important initiative and I would wish to see countries like Japan and countries like India uh, joining the One Belt, One Road initiative and uh, even maybe uh, doing things together in Africa. There, um, India and Japan are competing with Chinese interest but why not collaborating? Uh, it would be good for the continent. Switzerland, of course, you understand the situation. Uh, why, what kind of opportunity is Switzerland seeing in being part of the Belt and Road Initiative? I think Switzerland um, uh, wants to be an active partner and uh, not just um, being in China. Of course, there's a lot of investment in China, but going to third countries together, you know, for example, to Central Asia, countries like uh, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, and Chinese Swiss companies can jointly go there. And if you read um, 
the um, status of the um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it's actually an open invitation to companies from all around the world, but many multinationals just don't know it, mm. and they don't know how to apply and how to get involved. Um, I think Swiss companies can take the lead because we got this free trade agreement, a very pragmatic uh, partnership between both countries, even yeah. so, of course, China is a very big one and Switzerland is a very small one.